Thank you. Okay, here we go again. It's, it's, it is scary to have one presentation. It's even more scary to have two because if nobody shows up, well, <laughs> you kind of know what you did. You did something wrong. And today you guys are my heroes. You show up again. That's excellent. How, how many of you guys actually did see my first presentation? A and uh, who didn't? Okay, so is there's... Okay, that's, that's good. Uh, there's... It's not going to be any repetition, but you know it kind of does mix a little bit. So I might kind of talk about what I just talked about or something like that. Okay, so this is the I call this uh, presentation for ten mistakes the Java developer probably will do if a DBA don't assist you. And I'm going to talk about some n technical issues. I'm going to talk about some non-technical issues. Uh, my hope is that you will learn some new things about uh, relational databases. Um, hopefully, it will make you a better developer. And uh, <coughs> if you really, really need performance and scalability, you might want somebody to, to assist you. And I say somebody. I, I, I'll, I'll get to that. So, turn this on. And again, I, I work at a small company called Wright Consulting. Um, my name is Lars Jensen. Yes, I, I am a, a, a lost fish on land on a Java conference. I'm a database guy. And yes, that is kind of scary. Uh, I did this earlier today, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I think it's <laughs> recorded, so if you just uh, watch the recording from the earlier presentation, and this or or some of the customers we are work with. This is my contact information. Just scan the QR and this will just pop up. Uh, I also showed this slide today. And for those guys that was not here in the morning, I, I'm from Bergen in Norway. And as I said earlier, it's a very cozy, cozy place where you could actually down on the harbor here, you could find this very nice place just as in Copenhagen. You could go out, have a nice beer and enjoy your friends. The trouble is that in Bergen, it looks like this 36, uh, 306 days a year. So last night I was out on the speaker's dinner and this one guy, he said, you should bring a shorts tomorrow because we're going to go swimming. And hey, I'm from Norway. This is what I brought. <laughs> and luckily, they could give me a t-shirt so I could leave my sweater at the uh, uh, hotel. So, but uh, at least it makes it kind of uh, uh, nice to work with uh, uh, IT because you could stay inside. So, in this uh, description of this talk, I decided to write, first of all, there is a fundamental mistake in the title of this presentation. Really, what is the mistake? Anybody? Probably. Probably. <laughs> uh, yeah, it could be. That's a good suggestion. That the DBA will me? Yep, that is it. The DBA is the <laughs> logical error of this title. And I, I, I tried to explain. And that actually brings us to the my first number one point. A DBA is not a DBA. And, you know, if you were confused from before, you probably definitely are now. So let me try to, I, I'll tell you a story. You all know this guy. Uh, is it Djokovic is a very good tennis player. I used to be a tennis player. I was actually pretty good. Not in the league of Djokovic. But I qualified or I won the re uh, regionals in, in my uh, region in Norway. Uh, and I continued to play tennis in my 20s. And at the age of 27, I, you know, not many people actually put a picture of their wife in the presentation. But on, <laughs> on the age of 27, I met this girl called Ellen. And yes, we are married today. And she was a Norwegian champion uh, in squash. And she had been that for 14 years and actually was ranked by uh, the top 30 players in the world. So, you know, t t tennis and squash is both using a racket 
and it's a ball. It had, could only bounce once. You hit it either over a net or over a list. You know, so being a good tennis player, I thought, hey, I'm a good playing squash. So we kept on playing, you know, and after two years, we had this conversation. And what you're going to see now is a real conversation between me and my wife after a game of squash. And it goes something like this. Ellen says, why do you get so angry when you lose against me? Do you really think you could win? And if I wasn't angry from before, I was kind of getting there right now. And my answer is that, well, the score was 9 to 11, and I was leading 9 to 3. I really should have won that game. And Ellen, she was just very calm and just said, well, don't you think I'm a little bit nice to you and I actually let you lead? And now I was turning red. And I said, no, why, why in the world would you? And she said, OK, then. Next game, I'll play with my left hand. Oh, come on. I'll easily, I'll, well, I don't remember what I said, but I, I had to take the challenge. And I guess you know, you know what happened, you know. <laughs> I lost. And the worst part is that I lost 11 to nothing. Why am I telling you this story? Well, I really learned a lesson. And yes, we are still married. Yes. But the lesson learned was, yes, both tennis and squash involves a racket and a ball. No. Knowing how to play tennis does not make you a good squash player. And knowing Oracle internals, being an Oracle DBA, knowing how to install, configure, patch, upgrade, backup, store, restore, monitor, administer, maintain an Oracle database does not necessarily make you suitable for a development project or to work with performance. But yes, being a tennis player, if you practice or after practice, you will sooner or later actually become a reasonable sports player. And yes, I have one against my wife now. And you make question, well, she probably let you. I don't know, but we're still married. Okay, so actually, I think this, this, is, uh, this is something you really, I, th I think actually this thing has, has, this is the reason for this developer DBA thing. Because if you take a developer and you take a DBA, in my mind, they have nothing to talk about. I mean, they, they don't. They live in different worlds. You know, they, they, they have different speeds in the body. You know, developers fast, you know, you want to do something. The developer, no, I mean, the DBA is very slow, you know. He, do, you know, he doesn't have time to actually do this for you because he has this database he's going to maintain somewhere. So, and this is even worse. And this is why I call it the picture of the trolls. There are Norwegian trolls because this is, this is what I, you know, I think that the trolls are something very Norwegian. And this thing, I don't know, because this is my uh, experience from Norway. So I don't know if it's the same in Denmark or anywhere else. But I feel that the companies and organization kind of, you know, they ha you, you have all these developers working, you know, in development tests. And you have all these DBAs. And you only have the DBAs working in production and maintenance. And if you are lucky, or actually, it wouldn't matter. They take some of the DBA, put in the uh, in a development project, and what does he do? Nothing. He, he you know, wh what could you use that guy for? Really nothing. And he's probably just put in your project maybe 25% of the time, and very late in the project, and is actually no use. So, and I use this use this slide earlier today too, it's so important that you actually use the right resource. And trust me, it might not be a DBA. So next time pr somebody says that you're going to need a DBA, no. Make sure that it actually has the qualification it needs to be in a development project. Okay. <laughs> that was number one, non-technical. And uh, number two, performance is a feature. And this was something I was talking about earlier today. 
And I'm not going to do a lot about it, but it's very, very important. And I showed this slide that's saying that when I say performance is a feature, I mean that you have to design, code, and instrument your application to earn performance and scalability. So a lot of developers, they focus on functionality. And hey, that's, that's what the customer actually asked for. But you need to remember that fun functionality is actually gone when performance is lost. So you really have to start focus, focus on performance early in design. And if you're really going to have performance and scalability, you might need some assistance. <laughs> And what you actually should do is try to think of where is my bottlenecks? Where is this application really going to hurt? You know, and it might be some features that are called very often, or it might be some features that read a certain amount of data and kind of concentrate and make those uh, work and probably do a proof of concept very early to see that your design actually will work. And I see a lot of uh, um, requirement specification that does not have SLAs in them. You just throw it away because you don't know what to build if you don't have an SLA inside the requirement. Because if you don't know how fast and how much it's going to actually be running, you don't know what you're actually going to build. And, you know, I've seen so many times that when you discover these things too late, it's a whole lot more expensive to actually fix these issues. So again, use your re resources right. Okay, uh, let's jump to the instrumentation. And this was the main part of the last presentation. And well, it might be a little bit boring for you guys that were there, but I will very quickly just sh show the, the concept of uh, instrumentation in Oracle and in other databases, or actually in the JWC specification, you have this feature called set client info. So you need to instrument your code. And here I just grab a connection, and before I actually run my code, I set some tags that's put into my database. And in this case, I put in a client ID, module, and an action. And a client ID is a uni unique identifier for that certain push on a button. So if, if Mike is sitting there hitting payment list, I get a unique ID. Then I run my code. And when I'm finished, I close the connection. And when I do that, those are reset. So by doing this, I could actually, on Oracle, uh, on, on my database side, actually turn on trace for that certain feature. And if I want to, I could also turn it on for a certain user. So when Mike comes along, hits the payment list, my code would set the metrics. <coughs> and because I've turned on trace on that payment list for Mike, it will actually trace everything that goes on in that certain push of a button and uh, these tags will actually show in my uh, trace file. Oh, I forgot to have it. But also, probably in a log somewhere here, you will also see this client ID. And you will see that, oh, this one took 9.5 seconds. So what can I do with this? Well, I could take my client ID and go back to my DBA and tell him that this push of a button just took too long. So the DBA could actually use this tool to filter out all the information related to that push of a button, have a trace, a trace file with only that information, and make a report out of that. And you see this report, this is just a part of the report, is the time profile. And if you're going to actually tune something and work with performance, you need to know where the time goes. And this push of a button actually took 0 0.278 seconds in the database. And even those sh small response time are going to be able to tune. Because on the top here, I see that almost 50% was an I.O. And I could remove that by either removing the three calls or uh, shorten the, the mean time, buying uh, more expensive, faster disks. 
the only way I could actually tune this. So my, my suggestion is that you actually take the such instrumentation and actually make them a non-functional requirement. Okay, we're soon getting to more technical <coughs> stuff. And this is something I've seen around. It's not a big deal, but I just wanted to mention this. And it's, it, this is very important. Don't try to implement database independence. Have you heard the notion database independence? Let me tell you, unless you're working with very small systems with very few users, there is no such thing as database independence. If you think so, you will probably have bugs in your code. And the reason for this is that database system is not a black box. They are implemented different ways and work totally different ways. Oracle has something called um, read consistency. And it's about uh, multiversioning you know, how you actually lock data and let others uh, read data if you are changing it. And uh, DB2 doesn't have that. It doesn't have read consistency. So how in the world could you take a code working uh, towards Oracle and just run that code in DB2? You can't. You will have a bug. So actually, you need to read the manual. <coughs> If you're using Oracle, you probably pay a lot of money for your license, so you might as well use it. This is actually a conversation I had uh, with a company, and they had a batch job that was running very bad, and my suggestion was actually I could easily rewrite this uh, using PLSQL. And the answer from the company was, nah, we want to be database independent and don't allow for the use of PLSQL. Okay, I have been there for a while, so uh, I knew that they were using triggers and sequences. Oh, sorry. It's good if it wasn't you. Uh, and I know that you're using analytic functions, and you're using SQL 92 outer joins, which are Oracle proprietary. Uh, well, yes, all of those. So do you really think you ever, ever will switch your database? And after thinking for a while, I said, no. So could we actually rewrite that batch up using PLSQL? And after a while, I said, ah, OK, then. So you know, go I don't, don't even think go there. And this guy called uh, Kerry Osborne, he was asked the question, what do you think about database in independency? And he, asked, he, he answered, I think the whole idea is crazy. It's kind of like my decision of switching from PC to Mac just a few weeks ago. After switching, I could c continue to run Windows <laughs> on my Mac and basically not change any of my habits. And that way, I could easily switch back. Well, it doesn't make any sense. If you buy Oracle, if you buy SQL Server, know what you have and use the features. OK, that was a small thing. Let's go into some more technical issues. This one you have seen before. Uh, don't forget to use binary variables. Or I should say, I hope you know already. But I might show you some aspects of this you didn't think of. So what is binary variables? Well, you call it prepared statements. And you write something like this, prepared statement PS, and you have a result set. And you write the uh, fire towards your connection, prepare statement. And you use a binary variable in your statement. Why are we doing this? No prize, only honor and glory. SQL injection. That's a good point. SQL injection, injection, and uh, that's actually what I'm gonna put a point here. And it's all for free. That's right. Avoid. Uh, and other suggestions. 
execution plan. And what is the trouble by not using binds? Uh, you could actually reuse that. Oh, why don't you do that? No, don't do that. Please don't do that. That's ugly. Uh, you had a feature in Oracle. You could actually set uh, Oracle to, 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 to kind of exchange this uh, with binds. Uh, and I think they kind of suggested that in Oracle 9 somewhere, but you won't find it uh, as a suggestion anymore, and there's a reason for that. It might work, it might not work. And the, one of the reasons is that you have something called histograms. And, well, let's not go into that. But why? You said something about reuse the... And, okay, why do we want to reuse the execution plan? Yes, it takes some time, but trust me, that is not the worst part. Because if you use literals directly in your statement, you're going to have to, it's a totally different uh, SQL, and you're going to have to hard parse it every time. <coughs> but trust me, Oracle does that amazingly fast, or any other of the databases. It goes like quick, you won't notice it. It just like boom. So there must be something else that actually, yeah. Uh, actually, not anymore bec because you would also have a do a soft parse if you didn't do a hard parse. So, but okay, let me. Good suggestions. Hard parsing is about using the shared pool in your database. And when it's, when it's going to do a hard parse, it's going to use a lot of resources in your shared pool, actually doing a lot of work. And it's going to use a lot of the memory areas in your shared pool. And memory areas is kind of, um, it's not kind of, it is protected by something called latches. And latches is something very, it's, it's not a queue. It's, it works very differently than a queue. So if I was, a la if, if, if I was the code that was going to do some hard parse or something, or if I was, was going to check if it already was a hard parse, or gonna, so I, I, I would have to try to get to the latch, <coughs> try to get it, and if I didn't get it, I would, I would start spinning on the CPU, trying, 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 trying. And if I got it, fine, I would do my work and continue. If I didn't got it, in Oracle, it would actually spin like that for 2,000 times. And if I don't get it by those tries, I will finally go into a sleep. And if, if I actually come into to a situation where I go into a sleep, there are going to come other people in. And if the system is so busy that I didn't get the latch, somebody else is probably not going to get the latch. And things are going to get building up, and you have a big issue. This happens. When this thing turns up in the top five weight events in your system, you're screwed. <laughs> and you have different latches, but it's very specially the, the shared pool latch is one of the areas in the, the database that is very uh, easy to, to, to get a, a contention. So this is the number one reason why you should not hard parse. This, you know, is almost spending all the time, is of all the time actually spent in the database, it's just spending a lot of time. This is, these are seconds. It's just, yeah, do, do, it's just a lot. No, sorry, here is the time. You know, almost half the time of everything is going on in the database is just waiting for a latch. And this system does not scale. It's just about to just cram down down on, it, on his knees. So yeah, you mentioned the SQL injection is just for free. So, so let me take this a little bit further. Who are, uh, oh well, let, let's just, uh, what about wearing in lists? Uh, a wearing in list is where you search for an in list. In this, I search for account numbers, and I don't know how many account numbers are actually gonna search for. I know that in execution time, but the first time I, I might search for one, next time I might search for two, and next time I might search for three, and so on. And I have seen actually somebody search for 60,000. So that's a, 
a, a very used variation of SQLs because the SQL is going to look different all the time because there is going to be a new bind variable all the time. How do we actually solve this issue? Well, a lot of people think, developers think, well, I usually use binds. But actually, for a very endless, uh, it's so trouble, you know, I don't know actually how to do this. So let's, let's just uh, use my literals right here. I use the binds everywhere else, but not in this case. That could be catastrophe, because if that query is run a lot of times, with different, uh, or actually, uh, that's not doing, uh, it, it's going to have to do hard parts every time. And it's going to probably, if that's a lot of run a lot of time, it's going to kill your system. But even if you did use binds, you would have an issue. Because if you had like 300 different uh, versions of this, you would have to hard parse 300 different versions in your shared pool. How is Hibernate doing this? You don't know, do you? How many are using Hibernate? Perfect. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> you, you're going to be so scared now. Oh, I need to go back, go back and change this. Well, not really. <coughs> well, Hibernate actually does it. It just puts in another bind variable where it needs that. And most of the time, that works perfectly fine. Because it doesn't really matter if you have, like, it, when it comes to account numbers, this is a query from uh, payment where I, I used to work. And they, it was usually one or 10 account numbers coming in. So on the max, I would actually have 10 different uh, execution plans or, or uh, cursors in my uh, shared pool. And that's okay. That definitely not kill my system. But what if I put another list into this? So let's say I had 10 different here, and I have 10 different here. If you add those, that's 100. And I did another in list where I also could have 10, and it makes 1,000. And if you had some of these queries coming in often, it could just kill my database. So you really need to know what Hibernate or whatever ORM API you're using. So how could you actually solve this issue? Well, I use Hibernate. I think it's great. It makes me code very fast. Uh, uh, and But I need to know what's going on. Because I need to kind of, g if, if there are situations like this, I need to maybe handle this just another way than using Hibernate. So. What could I do? Well, I could use feature in SQL. So this is kind of hard to actually get in just one minute. So, but I, I'll try to explain. I could make me one bind variable where I put in the list of my values. So here I'm going to search for uh, in all users where usernames in. And this is my list where I actually should put in, in sys and system. But I cannot just put in the bind variable. Search for uh, all username that was equal sys comma system. That's nobody. So I could use the with clause and make me a table. And I could use the connect by level that will actually, if I have the number of two here, it will actually make two rows. That's a very neat feature to actually, if I need five rows, just do a select from connection, uh, connect by level less or equal to five. Then I have five rows. And I get that because I take the length of the whole thing and I remove the commas. And if I remove the commas uh, and add by one, it actually this would turn into two. So <coughs> up here, I could actually kind of use some somewhat more advanced SQL to actually jump through the different values. So when I run this, the first value would actually be sys. The next value, the next row will be system. So I actually could use this down here. So it doesn't really matter how many values that actually comes in this list. The SQL will look the same every time I fire it. 
So this is actually how you could solve that issue by using SQL features. And now you don't have a varying in-list problem anymore. So what about skewed data? And do you have histograms in your database? You probably do. And why do I know? Yeah, well, if you started off, if your database started off with very little data, Oracle has a tendency of actually making a lot of histograms very early. And if there was a histogram there, it probably stay, stay it will stay there for the rest of, of the life of the database until you actually delete that. And what is the issue with histograms? Well, why do we use binds? Well, we use binds to actually have plan stability. We want one plan for every execution of the SQL. Why do we need histograms? We need histograms if we have skewed data. And we want a different execution plan for the same SQL. So they are totally opposites. And in the different versions of Oracle, uh, yeah, um, I, d I don't think that's a good question. What is a histogram in a database context? And I could use two hours to actually explain that. Uh, yeah, yeah, you were so close. We could take it afterwards, you know, because I think I have so little time here, so I just leave it for now. But just ask me in the hall. Uh, it's, it's just about, okay, I'll give it to you. Uh, it's if you have a, a table storing members and you had one member that was a female and 999 that was a man and if you were going to search for uh, where f uh, sex equals to male what would you use an uh, index or a table scan well you, you were going to read all the data in the table so you're definitely going to use a table scan but if you use bind variable, it will use the same qu query plan. Would actually, it, will, it will get a query plan the first time it actually parsed the thing. And depending on if the first time that is actually giving you the execution plan. So if you first time search for a man, it will be a table scan. If you first time search for a woman, it will give you an a index scan. But yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, it, histograms, you could actually store information on a column that actually shows the distribu distribution that shows that, well, there's only one woman, but there are 990 m men there. So that's why you not always should use binds. So if you have um, uh, data uh, like... Um, data warehouses where you're going to fire one query and you don't need it to parse again, use the literals. Because then, then Oracle could actually read your literals and say, well, and the next time you fire it, it will, will do the hard parsing again. So it kind of depends. But the, the, the main rule is use binds. But OK, that's, that's kind of what a histogram is all about. But it's, it's complex. And th this is why, again, Bring a resource that actually knows this. And I tell you, a DBA, he probably don't know this. He, he kind of knows what a histogram is. But he, he wouldn't be able to tell you, and he's definitely not going to be able to actually do the right things. <coughs> okay, sorry. <coughs> so that brings me to the, my next point, point, actually. Don't really rely on your arms. I'm sad to say but. It's not the same as not using ORMs. It's definitely not the same. So I use Hibernate. I, I love Hibernate because it makes me code fast. But the important thing is that when you have a feature, you know, the performance here is, is measured by the response time. And the response time is actually the code path. And if I use, a, use Hibernate, and just use it, you know, not knowing what it actually does. And if you actually find one row, I know that Hibernate is going to do that perfectly well. 
But if I have those queries that run a lot of different times, have varying in lists, if, if I really going to find a lot of data, you know, I want to know what go goes on here. So I was in a project once, one, one time, uh, and it, it was in production. They were doing this bash thing, and, and uh, they used Hibernate. And it, it, it used to be OK, but when the data grew, it suddenly started to go very slow. So by the time is almost the whole system crashed, it was not just running anymore. They, I got involved, and I did a trace. And they were using batch insert, inserting uh, one million rows in a, a table. And that batch insert, well, that, that was smart. You know, doing things in batch was pretty smart. But what they didn't see was this little guy firing towards the database for every single insert. So inserting, uh, using Hibernate, inserting one million rows, Hibernate will actually fire this query a million times towards the database. Because they didn't know what Hibernate was doing. I don't know if they still do this in, in the latest releases, but you better watch out. You need to know what Hibernate is doing. And again, you could actually use this. If you set your metrics, run your code, afterwards you could actually use those metrics, do a select from Vidor SQL where module <coughs> equals your feature, and it will tell you. It will tell you what kind of SQLs is actually run, how many times it's run, and how many fetches is it, and you know, you've got a lot of information there. So it, there's actually no excuse of, you know, blaming on Hibernate. You're the one that writes the code. You're the ones that has to check. Okay. <coughs> so it's not enough to write the SQL. Sorry, guys. You all thought that, didn't you? So even you know, if you using Hibernate, you have checked the SQL. It's just it's not enough. And I tell you why. Have you ever heard about fetch size? Yeah, what is fetch size? No price, just glory. What is fetch size? Yes, as pr yeah, we call it fetch, in a fetch. And I, I, I show that. I show you how Oracle works, uh, or actually any database work. Uh, if I do this query, select start from employee, where department ID equals 10, and I do just a little trick to know that I'm not going to get more than 20 rows. So row num, row num is just that my first uh, row is going to be number one and two and three. And I just say that, well, I only want my 20 first ones. Uh, and if I have more than 20 rows, this is what is going to happen. On the client side, my OJDBC driver is going to fire this OCI statement execute to side, I have something called the OPI, uh, Oracle Programming Interface, that actually going to fire or uh, translate that into a bundle execution. And back in the old days, in Oracle 7, it actually had to do this separately. Like, do the, and that's a lot of round trips. So finally, it just can actually bundle these together from Oracle 8. It could actually do an execute, parse, bind, and it actually does the first fetch. But what is the default value? It's 10 rows. So actually, every time you fire a query using OJDBC, it actually goes to the database, get 10 rows, and your database could actually stop there, or it could, or your client could actually stop there, or you could fire another. And if you just write on the uh, SQL, it will fire again. So it will say, well, now I do my second fetch, and that's why it's called fetch2. So I do my second fetch, and on the server side, it actually do 10 more reads. And if those rows were actually packed in the same blocks, I have actually have to read the blocks again. Because in this waiting time, Oracle couldn't let me actually hold these blocks. So after sending these 10 rows back, I have to let the blocks go. And when I get the new, new fetch call, I have to read probably the same blocks again. Is that stupid or what? Yes, it is. 
and not is even get <laughs> because yes i done the sql and i know that it's only going to be 20 rows but oracle doesn't know that so it fires back and say is there any more rows and it does the fetch look into the blocks again and uh, well actually know that uh, I could use a, a stop count so actually the, uh, the Oracle database will see well uh, I just got 20 rows I will actually fire thus the third call and this is set this the, the fetch size so if I set this fetch size for 21 this would happen I would just call this once and get my 20 rows. And well, you know, in a regular application, does this it doesn't really matter. It, it's so quick anyway. But if you're really going to perform and scale, these are the things that you're going to have to do. But it just makes a difference. <coughs> Uh, the tuning guide s it, uh, actually tells you that you should write your SQL, set your uh, uh, fetch size. So the tuning guide actually tells you to do this. Uh, oh, the DBI tuning guide? No. Uh, the question was: Is is you you find anything about d this in the DBI tuning guide? DBA tuning guide? No. Uh, if what do the DBAs learn? They I have been doing the course. I, I was an instructor at the Oracle doing the DBA course, and we had a five-day performance course. And it was not really about performance. It was about system. So DBAs don't know a whole lot about performance. OK, maybe I don't know how many rows I'm going to get, but I might know that I'm going to at least get more than 10. So you should probably set it a little bit higher. How high should you put it? Well, don't put it up to 10,000. Just maybe put it down to 100 or 200. But I have seen when doing batch jobs, I have actually uh, put it sometimes up to 10,000. That's very seldom. Uh, but I have actually experienced that my batch went a whole, you know, if, th if this was a batch, man, all this boom, 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 boom going on. Crazy. I could just get 10,000 rows at a time, removing all this back and forth. <coughs> so next question, who is responsible for the execution plan? And I have put up the Oracle, the developer, or the debate. Well, when it comes to the execution plan, uh, Oracle will, will do its best. So it will make an execution plan for you. and. But what does it need to make a good execution plan? Uh, a luggage? Knowledge. knowledge. Yeah, that's that. That is true. Yeah, that is perfectly true. Actually, it needs knowledge, and you, you, and the DBA is not going to have that knowledge. So that's perf perfectly right. Uh, you, the developer, is actually having that knowledge, but it needs another thing. It needs an access path. It actually need those indexes because, and again, who is responsible for creating the indexes? That's certainly not Oracle because Oracle can't do that, and probably not the DBA. It is the developer actually knows your application, so it is probably you making the indexes. H how many do indexes make indexes? That's good. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's look at an example here. Uh, I have this table called T object. It's just, uh, uh, I have an ID, I have an object name, object type. It could be a, like an, an index, it could be a table, it could be a, a package, and I have a created date. So I make this index on my table. Create index, the name of the index, on T object, and I list my two columns. And I do something like this. How many of you guys that said there were making indexes have ever done this? 
Nobody. And why not? Because you didn't know about it. And your DBA probably didn't know about it. What is it? Well, what is an index? An index is a sorted thing. You know, by default, it is sorted. So when you make an index like this, I will sort all my object types. So uh, maybe the index come first. And in my index block, I would have this index, 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 together with the created date, created date, created date. But by saying compress one, I would actually only store this first column once in every block. So when I'm storing in the block, storing index, I only store it once, and I get all the different created dates and the row ID. So my index get a whole lot of smaller. It will be faster. I will scan less data. It will take less space. Mo basically, your, your buffer cache is basically storing indexes. So it will take a lot less space in the, in the, in the buffer cache, and the, your whole system it actually works better. Why didn't you do that? Because you didn't know. Now you know. Because you don't know uh, the cache. Is, if this uh, thing is not repeated, so if this was, uh, 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 if I had so many different object types, so you know I just didn't repeat that. It is a small overhead here, so actually doing this would be stupid. So that's why you have to look for repeated columns. And yes, that column has to be in the front of the index. It has to be the first part, because I could compress by one. If I say compress by two, I would actually try to compress both of those. But this created, it also includes the time. So it would be so many different times, so it would be actually no use of compressing that column. Good question. So, <coughs> sorry. Uh, I'm going to teach you how to look at the execution plan because you could actually add this query here. So let's start from T object where object type equals table. And created is less than sysState plus one, and created is bigger than sysState minus 2000. I'm just going to find an interval, and I'm going to search for all tables, and I'm also going to search for an object name equals big table. This is a very easy, and you very quickly see that this column was not in my index. If I fire this, I get one row. If I didn't, if I, if I remove this last line and just didn't specify that the object name had to be big table, I would actually get something about uh, 4,000 uh, lines, rows. So <laughs> I look at the SQL uh, parsing schema is my user, and I find the query that actually had the big table. And I'm going to see this is my SQL ID. So from this, I could actually do a select star from table DBMS explant display cursor. And I put in my SQL ID and said that I'm going to see every cursors because there could be different actually cursors for the same SQL. If this different user was actually firing the same uh, SQL towards different tables, ex every uh, ex SQL actually needed their own cursor. So doing null, I say I, I'll, I look at every cursor. And I just say typical, and I get something like this. And what you see is that, yes, it's doing a range scan, and everybody would say, yes, perfect, I could move on. But no, <laughs> you have some information that is very, very useful. And at the bottom here, you have something called predicates. And you have something called filter and access predicates. And what it tells you is that I filter on access three, well, that's on my index. So I could filter object type equals table and created reading the index. But then I would have to find all those row IDs and not actually using this one. That would actually be over 4,000 row IDs. 
making 4,000 lookups in these blocks, and then filtering out every 4,000 row except of one. And this tells me this is not a good enough index. This query could run super fast because those 4,000 blocks was probably in memory. So you wouldn't notice anything on the response time. But when it comes to scalability, it would be a totally different ballpark. So don't just look at see yeah, user index perfect. No, you have to evaluate is that index good enough? And you could actually use those predicates doing that. And your DBA won't probably know. Okay, I, I think I'm very close getting there. Uh, I am actually just about eight, but I, I just do this very, very quickly. For, don't forget to use the correct data types. Uh, storing dates as uh, uh, strings is awfully stupid. You take away a lot of information from the optimizer. It just don't know the difference between, it don't know that there's a one day between those two dates. Uh, this was an example that I found that they were using Varshar, Varshar, and date, and they fired this SQL. And this is very important for you developers. And good at the beginning, but after a while, it started to, to go slower and slower. It was using JDBC version 11.107. They had an index on inst ID, on customer ID, and on date. But the query took about 120 seconds before I actually got to, to help them. And why did it do so? It, it was doing a table scan. It didn't use that index. And why didn't it? It was selecting only 30 rows. So it should actually be doing the index. So I did, a, and it did actually 80,000 physical IOs. Uh, so I did a trace and found that the bind the data type was types 1 and 180 and 180 and 1. And 1 is a Varshar, and that's perfectly correct. It was a Varshar. But what about that 180? Date is 96. What is 108? Well, 108 was a timestamp. What did Oracle have to do then? Well, it had to kind of do an explicit uh, conversion of the date to a timestamp, and in the index, it was storing a timestamp, so it couldn't use the index anymore. It could do it in the beginning, where the, ta where the data was very small and very little data, but as the table grew and more data came into the table, it suddenly realized that, well, it's not efficient to actually use the index anymore. Let's do a table scan, which in this case was very stupid. So the, deep, the Java developer has been using timestamp for his bind while it was a date. So it's actually very important that you use. Uh, and this next example actually brought the database down to his knees. And the developer for a date, it was actually using both number, date, and Varshar. And doing that for several different queries, it made like 81 different execution paths for every query. And when you took in account that you moved from Oracle 10 to 11, which actually had some new feature handling the bind versus histogram, it just broke the database. So, okay, there, there is uh, some more. Is don't be shoddy. Uh, I already talked about that. Uh, it could really break your whole uh, database. Uh, learn SQL. And I, I did have some slides on the SQL. But the nice thing about th this is This guy called Lucas Eder or they did that for me. You will find his presentation on the javazone.no, and he did a presentation about 10 SQL tricks that you didn't think were possible. Highly recommended. I think you actually tried to get Lucas here, but he didn't have time. So I really recommend that you read that. SQL is a very powerful language, and again, you get the system you deserve. Okay, I think you really deserve lunch. Thank you guys for sticking out. Thank you.